Today's episode is sponsored by Shudder. AMC Network's Shudder is a premium streaming video service serving members with the best selection in genre entertainment covering horror, thrillers, and the supernatural. You've heard of Christmas in July, but now get ready for Halloween in April. Shudder is making April halfway to Halloween month. Shudder has launched its biggest month of non-October programming ever with the premiere of its new series, Cursed Films, the season 2 premieres of The Last Drive-In with Joe Bob Briggs and Wolf Creek, the original documentary Leap of Faith, William Friedkin on The Exorcist, the first eight Friday the 13th movies, and many more. You can stream great thrillers, horror, and supernatural content for $5.99 a month or $56.99 a year. Shudder has the largest, fastest-growing, human-curated selection of thrilling and dangerous entertainment. Based on Rotten Tomatoes reviews, Shudder features the best-ranked movie, One Cut of the Dead, and best horror movie of 2019, Tigers Are Not Afraid. You'll have unlimited access to stream ad-free on all your favorite devices, iPhone, iPad, Apple TV, Xbox One, Amazon Fire TV, Google Chromecast, Roku, and more. My experience with Shudder has been amazing so far as it's brought back a major blast of nostalgia. As many of you know, my favorite horror classics have always been the Creepshow movies, and Shudder exclusively offers a reboot as a new anthology series based on the 1982 horror comedy classic. It's still the most fun I've ever had being scared. A comic book comes to life in a series of 12 vignettes over 6 episodes, exploring terrors from a platoon of American soldiers and their encounters with the Sinister, to finding a cure for weight loss through a fat-sucking leech. There's a massive selection of content and even an extensive international library. There's a range of genres and all types of movies from old classics to modern favorites. So get started streaming the best horror, thriller, and supernatural content around. Shudder's expertly curated collection includes titles like Tigers Are Not Afraid, Creepshow, and One Cut of the Dead. To try Shudder for free for 30 days, go to Shudder.com and use promo code Let's Read. 30 days of Shudder, that's S-H-U-D-D-E-R, for free using promo code L-E-T-S-R-E-A-D. Most people don't even believe me when I tell them, but I have a job where I work from home. People in my area mostly work with cars or in the medical industry. There aren't many jobs where I live. Thankfully, I was able to land a decent paying job that let me work from my home office. It definitely comes with its struggles, but it is hands down the best job opportunity available to me right now. It isn't always perfect. It definitely comes with its pitfalls. Sometimes you have to sit at your computer even when there isn't any work to be done. It's also very easy to get distracted. But I think my biggest problem has to do with the house itself. It's kind of creepy. The house itself is an old Victorian, like really old. We're talking mid-1800s. A family friend owned the house and sold it to me for a very fair price, basically gave it to me. I was super excited because it meant I got a nice big house to live in by myself along with my girlfriend. I'm a natural loner and I don't really care for social interaction, so I had a nice big house all to myself and girlfriend and job where I work from home with very minimal social interaction with other people. That was basically my ideal life. But the house's age meant that it was going to be scary at times. And I don't mean with ghosts or anything like that, but sometimes I hear the house settling in or making noises that I can't explain. I've actually had quite a few instances where I'll be sitting down and doing some work and then out of nowhere, I hear a noise that I just can't rationalize. I go exploring throughout the house only to find that nothing has changed. It's as ominous as it is frustrating. I did just about what anyone else in the world would do. I started to use background noise to drown out the disturbances. First I tried those quiet instrumentals on YouTube. You know the ones that last 5 hours and they're supposed to put you at ease or something. It didn't really work for me because I couldn't get my computer to be loud enough to drown out all the noises. It was also not very good at keeping my attention. There was one week where my work was really slow and there wasn't a whole lot to do. 
I still had to sit at my computer though. There was an understanding that I was allowed to basically do anything I wanted as long as I was available to my coworkers if something came through that needed to be done. I didn't quite know what to do with this time and just started watching documentaries on YouTube. It was actually pretty fun. I learned a lot. And so that next week when things started picking up again, I just instinctively turned on a documentary. I wouldn't be able to have all of my focus on it, but it was a lot better than having some ambient noise. It actually helped distract me from the sounds of the house. I guess I just didn't have enough mental focused energy to notice any of the other sounds going on around me, if that makes any sense. Well, it had been about two weeks of me watching documentaries while I worked. Everything seemed to be good. Until one Friday morning, I started work at 8 and this must have been around 10, I was sitting at my office chair working while I listened to a documentary about certain conspiracy theories when all of a sudden I heard an abrupt banging noise coming from upstairs. Like I had said, I hadn't been distracted by any noises for a while by this point, so the fact that I noticed this noise meant that it was probably serious. My fight or flight kicked in. You might laugh at me, but when I work, I keep a knife next to me. I ran upstairs with the knife and looked around for any suspicious noises. The banging had stopped and I didn't know where it had come from. I knew what section of the house that I heard it from, but there didn't seem to be anything out of place. I stood there for a few moments and then I heard it again. It happened right on the other side of my door. I immediately braced myself for there to be some kind of animal or something trying to get in. I didn't really know what to expect. I opened my door to see that the screen door had not been properly closed. My girlfriend didn't close it all the way when she left for work that morning. It was also pretty windy that day, so it was just going back and forth causing a banging noise when the wind got bad. This was kind of a breaking point for me. I didn't want to live my life in constant paranoia and fear of some kind of attacker coming into my home. We live in a safe area. There's never been a serious threat and I have run around my house with a knife way too many times now. I honestly felt kind of stupid, so I made a decision. I was no longer going to assume that someone was breaking in if and when I heard a sound. I put the knife in my dresser in my bedroom and decided that I was going to just be in to work while I was working, except for my documentary, of course. So there I was the next week. It happened on a Wednesday. I was sitting in my office doing exactly what I had set out to do. I was working, ignoring the noises, and listening to a documentary. I remembered the exact part of the documentary I was on when I heard it. The sound was the loudest sound I had heard in the house up to that point. At first, I reassured myself that it was nothing and that I need to fight against this paranoia. The sound continued, and I couldn't take my mind off of it. After about five minutes of listening to what sounded like rummaging and walking, I went upstairs to check. Bear in mind I didn't have any weapon on me and I was expecting some kind of reasonable explanation. When I got to my kitchen I saw that the front door was wide open. The cabinets were all open and there was a strange man rummaging through my stuff. I didn't notice until after the fact but he had been eating something. I remember screaming at him. I don't remember what I said but it was something to the effect of what are you doing in my house, obviously. And then he just ran off. Didn't say a single word. He took a loaf of bread with him, but I don't think he took anything else, other than what I had eaten before I came upstairs. I reasoned with myself that he must have been some sort of homeless man or something. I don't know why else he would steal a loaf of bread from a very ordinary looking house. And this was the worst thing that could have happened. On some instinctual level, it had proved all of my worst fears right. There was some kind of danger in my house, and of course, it was the one time when I didn't have my knife on me. I lucked out that he didn't try to hurt me or anything, but it's still horrifying to see nonetheless. I just work at a local coffee shop now. It's honestly my only way to stay sane. My mom is really good friends with one of the wealthiest people in our town. They have a daughter, my age. I don't have a crush on her or anything, but my mom has pushed me to ask her out before. Never did. Here's the weird thing about the situation, though. My mom and this friend, along with her daughter, 
all kind of act like their friend, like a bunch of high school girls getting together to gossip. My mom works in a beauty salon, so I guess I understand why she likes to act that way, but it's still pretty weird nonetheless. There was one specific occasion when this woman and her daughter were going to visit New York City. They decided to invite my mom for some reason. I don't understand why. I guess they really were better friends than I had previously believed. But my mom decided to say yes. So it was just me and my dad at the house. But here was the thing. They didn't have a dad at home. Their house was going to be completely unsupervised for the entire weekend. I was in my early 20s at the time, so I guess they thought it would be a good idea to ask if I would watch the house for them, which I agreed to do. I didn't get paid or anything, but they said I was allowed to eat as much food as I wanted, and considering that they were rich, I thought, why not? This also gave me an opportunity to write some short stories. I always loved writing, and I published some of my stuff online sometimes. I think it was that Friday night when I was watching their house. They told me that they had two cats, but... They were really scared of strangers, and I was probably not going to see either one of them the entire night. Didn't bother me, I just had to make sure that they had food and water, which they did. I was chilling at the kitchen table, pounding the keys on my laptop on my latest story, when, all of a sudden, I saw something out of the corner of my eye. I looked up from my computer to notice the ugliest cat I've ever seen in my life. Just imagine a hairless cat, but also morbidly obese and cross-eyed. It was honestly the strangest thing I've ever seen. Any one of those traits individually would have made a cat kind of cute, but seeing all of them thrown together in one pitiful excuse for a pet almost made me want to bust a gut laughing. I felt kind of bad for laughing so hard at this girl's cat, but it's not like I hurt it or anything. That had been a good break from writing, but then I got back into it. I remember being in the middle of writing a really interesting scene. This ghost was abducting the protagonist of the story, it's kind of a psychological thriller with a little bit of paranormal thrown in there. It's very spiritual and weird. I'm kind of a weird person. But that scene still sticks with me because as I'm writing it, I notice something outside. There was a man in a hooded sweatshirt walking around. I sat at the kitchen table, stunned. I didn't know what to do. I felt the adrenaline burst through my veins. Fight or flight. Well, I figured that my car was outside, so running wasn't going to do me much good, and after a minute of rationalizing the situation, I had no proof that this person was out to do anything bad. For all I knew, this could have been a jogger. I got up close to one of the windows to watch this man. He seemed to be sneaking around. He wasn't coming toward the house I was in, so I figured that I was at least safe for the moment, but then I noticed him looking into the window of the house across the street. I can only assume that... He was checking houses to see if people were home or not. Must have been an actual burglar. Just show up in the wealthy neighborhood and see who wasn't home. I don't know why he would do it at night though. Looks as suspicious as he did. We live in a gun state after all. And after a few minutes went by and I could tell that there were people at home at the house he was checking out. By the time he realized I noticed him do a 180. He was walking in my direction now. I was about to be face to face with this man. I saw him walking across the street and I immediately started to panic. I called the police as fast as I could and told them the situation, but they said it would be about 20 minutes before anyone could be here. I ran up to the attic to hide. I locked the door behind me. In retrospect, this was my biggest mistake. I should have turned on a bunch of lights and made it obvious that someone was here. I'm good at thinking, just not in the moment. The house must have looked uninhabited by the time I had gotten up to the attic. This made the house the perfect place to burglarize and steal everything. I was in the attic for about 10 minutes when I heard a window breaking downstairs. He was in the house. My heartbeat was inside of my forehead. He walked around the house for a few minutes. Thud. Thud. I heard the humongous boots marching across the wooden floors. He explored the house for a good while. I was really beginning to wonder where the police were. Typical. I heard him get close to the attic entrance and that was the moment that pushed me over the edge. I started screaming at the top of my lungs that I had a gun. I told him that I was going to shoot his head off if he didn't leave the house immediately. And to my absolute shock, he ran away. I watched him run down the street as I looked on through the window. It appeared that this guy was even more scared for his life than I was. 
The police eventually got there and I told them the entire story from beginning to end. They said that a couple of people had been reporting this guy in nearby neighborhoods so this wasn't the first night he's been out doing this. The police explained that this guy hadn't been violent on any of the occasions they'd been called. They said it was about the seventh time this month that they have responded to a similar incident in a wealthy neighborhood. I guess he's going around looking for an easy way to make money. He hasn't been face to face with any of the homeowners yet so maybe he isn't a violent criminal, just a criminal in general. I found the entire experience really interesting yet mortifying. Living through it was probably the most scared I've ever been. My mom, her friend, and their daughter didn't even come back early from their trip after it happened. I thought that was a lame move, but what do I know? For revenge, I ate every single pizza roll they had in the freezer, and if you're wondering, there were three bags of 90 pizza rolls. I ate over 270 pizza rolls that weekend, and I have no regrets. I sorely needed them after that borderline traumatic experience with the burglar. I want you to picture the middle of nowhere, rural Kentucky, an iconic country home, ranch style, the owners are wealthy, the closest neighbors live 15 entire minutes away, the closest gas station is a half hour, Walmart 40 minutes. Those are the circumstances under which I was raised, and then there's me, a pretty typical 20 year old who was born and raised in a relatively wealthy family. I was lucky enough to have been born to a father who owned a store in a mid-sized city. The city itself saw a major population growth in the 10 years after my father had purchased the store and it produced enough income that we immediately became the 1% in the state, probably the entire country too. My father took the money that he had made from the store and used it to purchase real estate which produced more money, so we kind of had buckets of money lying around. For some reason or another, my father thought the ideal life was away from civilization which is why he built this ranch home out in the middle of nowhere. It was also a bit of an inconvenient living life. After all, all the money in the world means nothing if you don't have stores to spend it at. But the older I got, the more my father educated me on finances. He also said that he didn't want us being corrupted by metropolitan living. I didn't really agree with him, but I respected him. There were many nights that I spent at the home alone. I was always a fairly mature kid, so my parents naturally gave me a lot of responsibility. The first time I was home alone I must have been 12 years old, and considering we had a house full of expensive guns, alcohol, and hunting equipment, you can understand how much trust my parents really had in me. There wasn't very much in the world I wasn't prepared for, but there was one experience in particular. Something that happened a few weeks ago that I still think about all the time, sits in my memory, haunting me. It happened one night when I was alone. My father had a business meeting on Saturday morning, so he got a hotel Friday night in the city with my mom. This left me home alone to watch the castle by myself. Again, something I have done a million times and never thought twice about. I have always been interested in business ventures online. The thing I have been experimenting with that night was video marketing. I was interested in making something go viral. Over the course of a few weeks, I probably had created six or seven solid viral video attempts, but only one of them accumulated any attention and it was a measly 100,000 views. Anyway, I remember sitting in my home office working on a cat video. On the far side of my room is my window. I can see the backyard. There's a mountainous structure in our backyard. Basically, a really big rock. It's pretty tall, probably about 50 or 60 feet maybe, and in front of it is all farmland. My father grew wheat, although he paid people to do most of the work, but here was the thing. There was a very strange shadow on the rocks. There were some lights from the electrical posts in the field and it was as if someone was moving around them or something. This was absurd. You guys know how tall those electrical posts are. The idea that someone would climb on top of one of them, or that there was some kind of animal or something on it really freaks me out. I really didn't want to lose electric either as I was really into that cat video. I looked out the window to see what was going on and all I could see was a shadowy figure on the light post near the light. My immediate thought was that there was some kind of freak that came out here and climbed on top of it, but I couldn't imagine why anyone would do that. 
I put my horror movie based fear to the back of my mind and rationalized that it must have been some kind of animal that had climbed up there. Maybe a large cat. It was far enough away that I could not give you a rough size. Could have been a bear, person, cat for all I knew. I just knew something was up there. Just to be on the safe side, I grabbed a pistol and my flashlight to go check out the situation. I made my way out there slowly. I got more nervous as the moments went by. Each step seemed to bring me closer to the unknown. My fear grew with the increasing distance between me and my house. The grass outside was dry. It was warm out. I slowly got closer and closer to the pole. By the time I got close enough to see the figure, I noticed that it was gone. I stood there in silence for a moment, contemplating what it could have been. I looked around to see if whatever animal may have been up there had fallen to death. I didn't see anything in the general vicinity. I always hated leaving the animals to die like that. I got down on one knee to say a prayer for what animal had been up there. I couldn't imagine that it didn't die, whatever it was. While I was praying, I heard a hiss behind me and felt it scratch. Claws dug into my back. I reacted the only way I knew how and flung my body around. I thrusted my elbow against whatever was behind me. I hit it really hard. In an almost instinctual way, I got away from it and immediately began firing my pistol in its direction. I must have gotten five shots off by the time I stopped and realized what I had done. I had obliterated a raccoon. It really freaked me out. The entire experience was kind of traumatic. Staying home alone was never quite the same. I called my dad and told him what had happened before driving myself to the hospital. I had to get a rabies shot, unfortunately, which may have been the most painful experience of my life. I discovered the next day that I had inadvertently shot two of the windows out of my mom's SUV. The parents made me pay for that with my own money, and no, I was not nearly as rich as them. The only money I had to my name was the money that I had made from my personal business ventures online. It was kind of lame. My dad always hammered into my head that the bullets I fire are my responsibility no matter what. It's not a bad lesson to learn for anyone interested in owning a gun. When I got out of the hospital, I went home and finished making that viral cat video, and it only got 3,000 views. You can't win them all. But yeah, I guess the moral of the story is that even rich people who are secluded out in the middle of nowhere still have to deal with stupid stuff like this happening to them too. Dang paranoia and dang raccoons. I was 14 years old at the time. I'm male, pretty typical. I would call myself a nerd. I like to play video games and I'm pretty good at them too. When my friends and I play Fortnite online, I always do the best. I went through a really hard time though. The thing is, I have really, really bad allergies, like horrendously bad. They're so bad that sometimes I even sneeze blood. I mean, my nose is bleeding from the constant allergies and then I sneeze blood all over the place like some kind of freak. It sucked. When I was 14, my mom wanted to try something out. She came home one day with a mysterious bag containing something in it. I remember asking her what it was. I thought it was going to be some kind of new type of tissue or some kind of air filter for the house. It wasn't any of that. It was a medicine. She said that this medicine was going to take care of my allergies. I really wanted to believe her, so I started taking this new medicine and all seemed to be working for the first few weeks. I didn't notice anything being off and everything seemed fine. My usual springtime allergies were no more. As you might expect, I just continued on with life like any other 14 year old would. I went back to playing video games, hanging out with my friends occasionally. I want to say it was about a month later that something started to change. I couldn't quite put my finger on it, but I wasn't feeling myself. I was in a bit of a brain funk. And it was strange because I normally feel really present and aware in the moment. I always attributed my mental agility to being the reason that I was the best out of all of my friends at video games all these years. I mean, why else would I be? But I wasn't as good as I used to be, though. I wasn't the best out of my friend group anymore. The skill gap between myself and at least two of my other friends seemed to vanish completely. It was as if my skill had gone down. I know it seems like a minor problem, but that really took me down a peg. I really enjoyed being the best there was, and now I wasn't. It made me feel sad, 
sadder than I've been in a long time, and it wasn't that I have never experienced tragedy or something else. I remember being really close to my grandfather, and he died when I was probably about 12 or 13, so I've gone through stuff before. But for some reason, not being the best in a video game really took a toll on my well-being, as weird as that might be to say. I gradually started pulling back from my friend group altogether. I would just play video games by myself. The social interaction seemed to be too much for me anymore. I didn't enjoy it like I used to. And that was when everything changed. I wasn't the person that I had been before. And looking back, I'm surprised I didn't notice sooner. It all came to a head one night. My mom had some kind of work function. Some kind of party or something that I don't really remember what it was. I just remember thinking it was stupid. I felt really alone. My dad died when I was younger and I was also an only child, so I was home by myself, 14 years old. You would think that a kid that age would love to be home by himself, but I didn't. I was horrified. I felt the feeling inside of myself that truly mortified me, petrified my bones. I wanted to end my own life. I just felt this intense sensation of worthlessness. I don't even know why either. I got good grades in school. I had friends, but I just didn't enjoy being around them anymore. I didn't know what had changed. I just had this overwhelming sense of loneliness. It was a dark, whispering voice in the back of my head that told me all of the horrible things that I hated to hear. This voice it told me that I should be dead, that I was just a burden to my mother, that I didn't have any real friends, that all of the guys in my former friend group moved on and completely forgot about me, didn't even care that I was gone. And here I was, alone in this house, all by myself, couldn't even think of a reason not to do it. I know exactly how I would do it if I wanted to. We watched a mental health awareness video in my psychology class at high school and all you had to do was take as many pills as you could and you would surely die. They called it a cocktail. I kind of wanted to have one myself. I remember sitting in my living room. I was trying to work up the nerve to actually swallow the pills. Couldn't bring myself to do it though. For some reason, something was stopping me and I couldn't figure out what. The voice in my head made perfect sense. I had no reason left to live. No reason would ever present itself in the future either. I was nothing in a big nothing world. I slapped my hand on the table. For some reason that gave me the burst of motivation I needed to start swallowing those pills. I opened the cocktail that I had made. Just random stuff from the medicine cabinet. Nothing in particular. I was going to take them one by one. I had my mouth already open and everything but... My phone told me that there was a text message. By whatever stroke of luck that hit me, I decided to answer the text before I decided to go. I slowly made my way to the other room and picked up my cell phone. Pressed the on button to see that it was my friend Walton. He was asking if I wanted to play with them. I texted back, yes. The next morning I told my mom about the incident. She was really concerned and wanted to send me for a psychiatric evaluation. But before we did that, my mom thought it might have had something to do with that allergy medicine that I was on. Well, it turned out that it was the entire cause of my depression. I was an otherwise happy and healthy kid. But that medicine had some particular side effects. Side effects that my mom didn't mention to me when I started taking it. And one of the major side effects was depression. It's been some time since I had been on that allergy medicine. It got put on recall... They literally had to take it off the shelves because it was making the users so depressed that they also wanted to end themselves. I'm really thankful that I was able to escape that situation with my life. I realized how close I was to really hurting myself. I almost died. And I'll never forget that experience. Ever since then, I never want to be home alone again. This story happened when I was 15. It's been almost an entire decade now, but I still think about it quite a lot. This is our situation. My brothers and I live with my mom. I'm the oldest of three and my mom generally leaned on me to get things done. This naturally turned me into an adult from a very early age. Even to this day, my mom talks about feeling guilty for having to thrust adulthood on me so early on. She thinks that I didn't have a childhood, and maybe she's right. 
As you might imagine, my dad wasn't really in the picture. He was an abusive drunk, and when I say abusive, I mean seriously abusive. Up until the time I was 10, he lived with us, and whenever he would get drunk, he would beat the life out of us. It was always terrifying. The only saving grace was the fact that he wasn't always drunk or had alcohol in the house. In fact, there were sometimes, months at a time, when he would go without drinking, and he was an otherwise pretty decent person. For all that was wrong with my dad, he would have probably been close to an ideal human being if he had not been for his rampant alcoholism and the demon inside of him that came out when he got drunk. The incident that got my mom to finally divorce him was horrendous. I had been in my room playing video games or something and he was in the living room. My mom just got home from getting the groceries. He accused her of having an affair at the time and of course this wasn't true, but he didn't believe it. He kept screaming at her that she was lying. It escalated to the point that he pinned her down on the floor and said that he saw her nose growing and then grabbed a screwdriver and cut into my mom's nose with it. There's still a scar from that day. Well, that all went down when I was about 10, so this is about five years later. My mom was bringing my two younger brothers on some kind of Boy Scout trip. They were both in the Boy Scouts and always felt left out because all the other kids had a dad. My mom's guilt drove her to volunteer and help out whenever she could, so she went with my two brothers for this weekend camping trip with the Boy Scouts. She really wanted me to go with them because she felt uncomfortable having me alone in the house. I insisted that I was mature enough to do it and honestly, I didn't even have friends that I could party with if I wanted to. She eventually gave in and let me have my way. I remember being in my bedroom, playing with my PlayStation. It was a pretty typical Saturday afternoon, but then I heard a car pull up. I didn't know who it was at first and I immediately got really panicked that I was going to have to call the cops. My bedroom window doesn't have a really good view at the driveway so it took me a second, but after studying the part of the car that I could see I recognized that it was my father's car. I was immediately mortified. I was on bad terms with him and my mom had a really serious restraining order put on him after they had separated. I got really nervous and I was not sure what I should even do. He didn't come into the house for a few minutes and I immediately started wondering what he was up to. I did the only thing that I could think of and cracked my window so I could hear what was going on outside. I thought that if I could hear what he was doing I would have a better idea. I immediately recognized that he was crying. His whimpering sound was really intense. I hadn't heard from him in years and my mom said that we would never see him again. But here he was, crying in our driveway. He paced around for a few minutes before finally standing still. I could hear his crying getting louder. Then he screamed. Pop. All I heard was a gunshot. The second I heard the gunshot, I immediately knew what had happened. I ran outside. I looked down at my father's lifeless body on the driveway cement. Blood. Everywhere. As traumatic as it may have been, I didn't cry. I didn't act emotional or anything. I just called the police. They got there a few minutes later and took me into custody. They wanted to keep me safe and secure until they could contact my mom. The rest of the story played out exactly as you would imagine. My mom apologized profusely. I had to answer some questions to the police. Nothing out of the ordinary. I don't really know what to make of the situation. I don't have much sympathy for the guy, and part of me is kind of happy that he did it. But looking back, I just kind of wish that he had done it where I wouldn't have had to have witnessed it. The entire experience made me never want to go stay home by myself ever again. It's been a long time since this whole thing had gone down, and even now, if I have to stay home by myself, I will make an effort to leave the house or to invite a friend over. I won't stay there alone. A couple of years have passed since this entire situation and I can't help but to think that it was all for the better. My dad was a seriously destructive human being and I know this might sound terrible, but I just wish that he had done it sooner. For those out there that haven't lived with a toxic and negative parental figure, consider yourself extremely lucky. The tribulations that I had to endure at the hands of my father fostered a lot of rage inside of me.
This story happened a month ago. It was hands down the scariest moment of my life. Everything turned out fine in the end. No one died or anything, thank goodness for that, but I really did not think that at the time. It goes something like this. My friend and I were very interested in witchcraft. We live in the Bible Belt and there has always been a strong stigma against paganism or spiritual beliefs other than Christianity. Like any sane human beings, we naturally rebelled and became fascinated with witchcraft, the occult, and other stuff like that. That's not to say that we're satanic or anything. Those kinds of people definitely exist, but we were really just interested more so than generally trying to discover a new religion or something. I mean, I still go to church every Sunday. Anyway, a couple of years ago, I had introduced my friend to witchcraft. She didn't know anything about it before, but wow, she really went off the deep end. I was only moderately interested, but she took it to a new extreme. She even runs some kind of witch group on Facebook. I heard it's pretty popular. She knows witches and warlocks from all over the world and regularly participates in paganistic festivals. This one weekend, my parents had planned a trip to go to the beach. It was their anniversary. They took a trip every year to somewhere different, although it seemed like they almost always picked the beach for some reason. It was never the same beach, but a beach nonetheless. Anyways, this was our opportunity to hang out all weekend without any interference from my parents or anyone else. As I'm sure you're already guessing, we were going to be doing some witchy stuff. That wasn't the only thing we had planned, though. Late that Friday night, we had simply watched a movie. The next day, we spent most of our time doing our nails and makeup. We didn't really have anywhere to go, so we just walked down to the convenience store that's down the road from my house. There's a small diner inside of it. They only offer a couple of things to eat, so we went there, got some waffles at like 3, and after waiting around for a while, decided to go back to my place. By the time we were getting settled in for the night, I could feel both of our moods changing. We were both getting really excited to do the ritual. We talked about it a little bit here and there. She told me that she had something grand planned for that night. She didn't tell me what exactly that was going to be, though. We got settled in for the night, and by the time we did, the sun was already setting. We were ready to do this ritual. I asked my friend if she wanted to do it, and she said yes. She went to her backpack that she brought to get something out. I wasn't sure what it was going to be. I honestly wasn't sure what physical objects you needed to do any kind of ritual. I mean, can't you just channel your spirituality or something? Well, I remember feeling something in my body change the second she got it out. The atmosphere was different. The hair on my arms were standing up, and she pulled out a Ouija board. I don't know if you believe in any of this stuff, but I can tell you that I was only a half-believer until I felt my body physically change the second I was in the presence of that board. There's a certain power to it. The ability to communicate with spirits or ghosts. Maybe something else entirely. Who knows? My friend brought the Ouija board to the kitchen table and we both sat down. My mind was racing with questions. All I can say for sure is that I wanted to talk to a ghost. I already knew who I wanted to speak with before we even started channeling anyone. My grandmother. She had horrible cancer toward the end of her life and that was how she died. She passed away in this house. It was a few years back. I was young. I always had this feeling that I didn't spend enough time with her. And I always had a lingering feeling that her spirit was still with us. And tonight was going to be the night that I got to speak with her once and for all. We sat down and began the ritual. Unfortunately, we didn't have any candles, so we just had to turn out all of the lights except for the stove light. There was also some light coming in from a street light outside, and it looked really good and spooky. I told her that we were going to be talking to my grandma first as she was still in the house with us. She agreed, and we started calling out to her. So here was the first weird part. I only addressed the spirit as my grandma. I never told my friend what my grandmother's actual name was. As much as I kind of wanted to believe that I was going to be able to speak with her, I felt like it would have been disrespectful to use her full name when doing the ritual, so I only referred to her as Grandma. Eventually, we got a reply. We asked if anyone was with us. The first time we asked, it went to no. Then again, the second time. But the third time, the pointer went to yes. Now this is where it gets freaky. Because when we asked who was with us, it spelled out my grandmother's name. Again, my friend did not know my grandmother's name. I just found it weird. After the name had been spelled out, my friend asked me who it was. 
When I told her that it was my grandmother's name, she started getting really excited. That wasn't the feeling that I got to. I got really freaked out. It made me nervous. And that was the moment that I had realized that there was more to this world than what we see. Way more. I totally get it if it doesn't prove anything for you, especially because you can't verify what I'm saying, but for me, it was more than enough. Unfortunately, that was the only paranormal activity that we got all night. Nothing else of interest happened. Didn't stop us from trying again the next day, though. My friend and I followed a similar routine on Saturday, and by the time it was getting dark, we had that Ouija board out. My parents had to be home on Sunday, so we knew that this was going to be our last night of doing this. So it happened like this. We sat down to try and contact another spirit. This time, we didn't try to contact my grandma. We just tried any spirit in the vicinity or in the house. I remember sitting down with my friend and saying, If anyone was with us, please, will you give us a sign? And at that exact moment, we heard a loud banging on the garage door. We both started screaming because we thought some kind of horrible spirit had been unleashed. We freaked out for a little while, but get this. It was my dad. He knew that I was letting my friend sleep over at her house and wanted to pull a joke on us. It may have been funny for him, and he still laughs about it sometimes, but it was absolutely mortifying for me in the moment. To think that I had unknowingly unleashed some kind of demonic beast into the world, that was truly the worst part, because it made me realize if we had somehow done something in the spiritual realm, there wasn't really anything we can do to undo it. There's no control plus Z with a ghost. This is hands down the most horrifying thing that it's ever happened to me. I still don't have any answers as to why it happened either, and I probably never will. I had recently graduated college, I was a marketing major, and I was having a hard time finding a job. I didn't have anything lined up for me right after I graduated like some of my peers, so I did what most people do and moved back in with my parents. Not gonna lie, it was pretty weird moving back in after having been away for so long. For as long as I can remember, it was just me and my dog, and now I was living with my mom and dad again. It sucked. I normally don't talk about this very much, but when I was younger, I had a natural intuition that most people don't have. I had some kind of ability to speak to ghosts or at the very least, to see them. I was that kid that always was talking to the wall and claimed to be talking to a ghost. I had no idea why I had this ability, but I knew that I did. I remember genuinely feeling a presence and making a connection with it. I always had to make some kind of spiritual or emotional connection with it before I was able to communicate with it. It's really weird to explain, but I can still do it. The ability never went away. It's a little bit more difficult now, but I've become very interested in it, especially toward the end of my college career. I spent many nights meditating and trying to form connections with spirits around me. So here's the thing. My parents had actually moved when I was in college. I never really felt a strong connection to their new home. Honestly, I didn't really like it. And I had never spent more than a couple of nights there. Even during the summer, I would stay at my apartment in the city only because, well, why not? And again, you can see why it was so weird for me and my dog to move back into my parents' house because I have never really lived in this house. It's not that it was particularly negative or anything, but anyone who is in tune with their mind and body and moves around a lot will remember that it is distressing even if there's nothing problematic about the move. You can be 100% financially, spiritually, physically secure and fine in every aspect of your life, but moving into a new home will invariably cause some distress. There was one Friday night when my parents had gone out for dinner. They wanted to have a night away from all the regular worries of day-to-day -day life. I have two other brothers and they're both in high school, so you can understand why my parents would need a break. My brothers, being my brothers, both went out to sleep over at a friend's house. They only had a year between them, so they hung out in the same friend group. And they all have this weird thing where they would sleep over at each other's houses and just play video games all night. That's left me and my dog Dorian home alone until my parents got home at least. I remember feeling really freaked out. Not in a crazy way or anything, but something just felt off. Like there was something in the air. It's really hard to explain. I remember being in my room reading an article on the best ways to get a job. It was about 9 o'clock at night. 
My parents probably wouldn't be home until about 11 or 12. I remember being really into this one article. I was taking notes on things that I could do to improve my resume, and then I heard it. My dog made one really weird noise. It was almost like a bark, but also a whimper. I knew something was wrong because he very rarely made noises. I rushed downstairs to see what was going on. He was sitting there perfectly fine as if nothing had happened, and this was extremely unusual. I looked around the house frantically. He had food, he'd just gone to the bathroom, and nothing around the house seemed to be out of place. I chalked up to him not liking being at my parents' house. It sounded rational enough. I made my way back upstairs to get back into the job hunting grind, and then I heard that very same noise again maybe 15 minutes later, and this time it really unnerved me. This was very out of behavior for my dog, and I had this odd sense of impending doom. I ran downstairs and looked around. For a minute there, I didn't even see my dog. I didn't know where he was. I called out to Dorian, but he didn't answer. Then I made the worst discovery of my entire existence. I realized that my dog was dead. He was just laying on the floor motionless. It was so weird because he was only about two or three years old. I closely examined his body and it didn't appear as if he had even been in a fight or a struggle of some kind. No blood, no bruises, no puncture wounds. It was as if he just laid down to take a nap and died. I remember feeling really sad. That sense of fear and adrenaline never went away though. I waited for my parents to get home. I was really psyched out and I didn't know what else I could even do. I felt like calling the police was a bit too extreme and I didn't want to be the college graduate turned adult who moves back in with his parents for a week and needs them to rush home because he's scared. And this all happened a while back. I still can't explain how my dog died. I ended up landing a job a couple of days later in a nearby city, and I was really happy to have been moved out of that house. It freaked me out pretty bad. And after an incident like that, my parents can visit me any time in the future. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r Let's Read Official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. If you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data. Located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, I still can't say, Worshire, shire, shash. <laughs>